one was. Very quiet. Yes. <laughs> Pete, I didn't realise you were going to be on this meeting. Uh, neither did I. I just had uh, great problems connecting, but I'm finally connected. So if you if you want to uh, stay or you want me to go, one or the other, let me know. No, I think, well, I think it only needs one of us, but... Uh... Is that all right, Jeremy? I think that was fine. Another yeah. one doesn't. That was, that was, that was, a, good, that was a, good, a good experience. Okay. Really good to talk to him anyway. And I'd like him to join the men's group, but he plays golf on Monday, which is which is great. Um, okay, I think maybe we better better get started. Okay, and hopefully you just let other people in as they as they come in, because um, I, I, I'd like to try and finish a bit earlier than three if we can. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the the timing is quite generous, so let, let, let's see how we go. Okay, so um, William, if I just say, share the slide deck, anybody yeah. who comes yeah. into the lobby, if you kindly just enter, let them in, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, okay, so we'll just move on to the next slide then. Okay. Uh, Lisa, do you want to deal with this? So I think this just is a matter of course in, in all of our meetings. So there is a ch chat function um, by all means. If you haven't been to our meeting before, please do state your name and any organisation that you're representing. Welcome, obviously, everybody um, who's joined us. It's great to see so many of our patient representatives on the call today. So thank you. Um, any comments that you want to um, raise, by all means, use the chat function. Or there's also a little hand symbol that you can sort of raise and raise your hand so that William will obviously then pull you into the conversation. So um, meanwhile, while the presentation's going ahead, if you'd kindly just mute, um, that just saves any background noise, etc. So thank you. OK, thanks, Lisa. Uh, OK, so in terms of apologies, uh, we have is Patrick McGuire, uh, Alec Oshra and Jill Moforth, uh, with the possibility of Jam, Backhouse and Louise Porter. Have you had any other? Nothing through this morning, no. OK. Uh, in terms of uh, the the minutes then, um, I'll move on to the action log just now. But before we do that, anything anyone wants to raise on the minutes that we're not going to deal with on this agenda? No, OK. Then we've gone to the action log uh, at the at the end of the minutes. We've got six actions. All of which I think have been have been dealt with. But Lisa, are there any that are still outstanding? The only one that's outstanding is in respect to the brain CAG lead and the haematology CAG lead, um, either making introductions or endorsing our patient reps who finally come forward to want to join the group. So I've chased it a number of times now, um, and I guess with regards to the pressures of obviously the, the clinical um, side of things, things are really quite hard just to yes. get that kind of meeting in the diary. So I will keep persevering and I've obviously let those people know um, that that's what I'm doing. OK, sorry, was that someone trying to say something that I missed? No? OK, and uh, as, just just go back to housekeeping for a minute. As Lisa said, um, either raise your hand using the little symbol or if that's, uh, you know, if you can't, if there's a problem with that. Uh, just, just do it physically, and I'll, I'll try to sort of keep a hand, uh, keep a look on for those hands. Uh, uh, you know, as we go through. Okay, that takes us to uh, item two. Then I think, yes, sir. Okay. So who's going to kick off on this? This is Gaynor. Okay, hi Gaynor. Hello everybody, um, and hello to the faces I recognise, and hello to those who I haven't met before, and um, it's lovely to be here, so I'm afraid I do have to drop out of this call at half past one, so apologies okay. I won't be here for the whole thing, but I just wanted to give a little update on the RDS programme and the related patient portal, which I have linked in with, I can recognise again, a few faces that I've spoken to about that. Um, so the... Um, National Cancer Team have now published um, the Faster Diagnosis Framework, 
This document um, sets out the NHS Cancer Programme's approach to faster diagnosis of cancer and seeks to consolidate and simplify documents that were previously shared, um, such as the rapid diagnostic implementation spec, which was published back in 2019. So was um, long overdue a bit of a refresh and the FDS best practice time pathways documents. So it brings together those objectives relating to rapid diagnostic centres and the faster diagnosis standard and those best practice time pathways and seeks to align all of this work with other related programmes, uh, for example, around the community, community diagnostic centre work. So that's a big piece of work that has um, come to, and this has been going on. I think we were speaking about this and it probably did come up in previous meetings here. That has been something that's been discussed and expected for a while and it was finally published um, a couple of weeks ago. So the Alliance are now working to review that um, and to highlight any key changes and how we can see that being rolled out and developed with our providers. And so our next step is obviously to complete those discussions as a team and then seek to hold engagement sessions with secondary and primary care colleagues to share that information. So that's a key piece of, of work that's coming up. Um, in terms of um, what was the RDS programme, we're still um, continuing the recruitment elements around um, the posts to support patients traveling through those diagnostic pathways. That's still a very key element and a very huge priority as part of those um, documents. So we're still seeking to complete recruitment um, to support delivery and have those key navigator roles in post to support patients through their pathway. So that's a real, a real key element. And also on talking about the supporting patients, Another big um, piece of work that we're doing around that is the development of the patient portal. And I know that has come to um, I think the last couple of PPP, PPG groups. And obviously, as I say, I recognise a, a fair few of you that I've linked in with about that. So we're now very kindly, we've met with a few of you and I really appreciate your input and your help with getting this off the ground. And we're linking with our design team to get some testing sessions in the diary. So I will be in touch with those of you who I've spoken to about the portal before um, and the key element around the portal will obviously be that supportive element to be um, key documents for patients to source and they'll also have a two-way communication tool with that navigator and it's just another means of communication for patients who maybe would prefer an electronic mode of communication and seeking information. So that's um, a key piece of work that we're doing. And also then we're looking at doing some upgrade work with our cancer tracking systems in the hospital. So three of our providers at Bucks, OUH and RBH use a system called InfoFlex. So we've had a project initiating nation meeting. So that's really exciting to get that upgrade in place to ensure that we've got a good, robust tracking and data collation system in place there and Great Western use an alternative system and we're linking in with them about their upgrade as well. So there's a key piece of IT work there to support patients coming through. Um, so yeah, as you can see on this slide, we've just got a few sort of key next steps for this. And as I said, we're looking as an alliance to review the framework and look to hold those engagement sessions to share that information with our primary and secondary care colleagues. Um, the national team did a very um, good rollout of the document last week, so it is very new and they're holding some very um, useful FAQ sessions so that we can also then feedback any questions that we have or that come through as information is shared. As I said, there's some continued development around the patient portal um, and we will be seeking to link in with everybody that we've spoken to so far and hopefully get further sessions in with you through March, due, uh, obviously based on, on diaries and your availability. Um, and then we'll continue to create and agree that key patient information documentation. As we said, that will be available at point of referral via portal um, sources or through our primary care colleagues. And we're also doing some important work around our referral performer to make sure that we can collate all key um, patient data to make sure we've got all the minimum data sets required so that we've got some real robust data for our data analysis work. Um, 
continued elements around supportment of recruitment. It's vital that we get the right people in post in these these roles to support patients coming through that diagnostic pathway and obviously to ensure that that onward management of care for not only cancer diagnosis but for non-cancer diagnosis is also undertaken so we that, those roles are absolutely key and the final point on there is I have just put our generic email address if anybody else did want to contact me about anything around um the program or the portal please do just drop an email to that email address it is monitored um regularly and if you did want to be involved in the testing and the development of the portal if you haven't spoken to me so far please do just drop an email and you'd be very very welcome would really really welcome that input and again i just want to really reiterate thank you to everybody who has given up time so far to meet with me because i really do appreciate it and huge thanks to lisa who has coordinated those connections so it has been really, really helpful. And I thank you in advance for um, future sessions that we will have for you to do the testing. So that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour and I'm happy to take any questions um, or if people want to have a think about anything, as I say, please do just drop uh, an email to that email address and I will get back to you or we can arrange a meeting, however works best for you. OK, thanks, Fiona. Does anyone have any, any immediate questions that they'd like to raise? OK. If not, then we'll sort of move on to um, the personalised care update. Is Natalie, are you there? I am, yes. OK, hi, over to you then. Lovely, thanks. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Natalie. I'm um, one of the project managers for personalised care within the Thames Valley Cancer Alliance. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick update uh, on the Health and Wellbeing Hub, which for anyone who doesn't know is a collection of patient hosted videos on the TVCA website. Uh, we launched the hub officially towards the end of January with 11 videos that cover this uh, sort of a variety of health and wellbeing subjects. Um, next slide, please. So for those of you who did attend in December, you'll remember that I presented the uh, progress on the hub at that point, And I went on to ask for your help with providing feedback on various aspects of the hub. Um, so first of all, thank you to everyone who took the time to watch one or, or more of the videos. And I'm really grateful for that time, um, both both to watch the videos and to complete the survey. So I gave uh, I had some really helpful feedback through that. And um, some of the learnings from that included keeping just at the forefront of our mind that we need to be really very aware of the use of language and, and sort of the words that we just take for granted within the health service. So not just giving the long form of an abbreviation, but actually becoming aware of some of the specific wording we're using that might not mean as much to viewers. Um, so these comments, what we've done, I've, I've sort of woven them into both the briefing for uh, speakers going forward and the recording process so that we actually hopefully produce a better quality of content. Um, and I also I was it was really nice. I had a few really in-depth chats with some of you and I can see a few people on the call today. And actually from those conversations um, came some really some really interesting themes around what to expect in terms of how you might feel following treatment and discharge. And so there's a piece of work ongoing with one of the um, OTs at the moment to sort of respond to some of those needs. Um, and then also via the, the PPG, we had some resharing within networks, which was really fantastic. And I know Vicky from Involve, I think I saw you on the call, very kindly featured the hub in our most in your most recent um, newsletter. So thank you very much to everyone for the wider sharing on that. Um, so overall, we've had a really, really positive response from from PPG members and sort of wider, wider um, sharings of that about it really just being a much needed and valuable resource. Uh, so, I mean, this is this is great feedback. And obviously we'll, we'll take on board suggestions um, sort of received via the surveys and conversations that I've had. Um, and going forward, we're, we're really hoping to expand the hub a bit to include some of the additional resources that we've been signposted to, um, including maybe sort of additional videos and exercises that are helpful for um, sort of people that have, have got a cancer diagnosis. Um, so really, I guess finally on the on the feedback there, I just wanted to make a real special thank you to David. Actually, I think David, I saw you just um, join the call. Uh, for he, in his words, he binge watched the whole lot of the videos in order to provide some really robust comments on all of the videos, and he then went on to present this as part of um, our update to the personalised care forum back in January, um, which was really much appreciated. 
and from this feedback I was also able to, to, to sort of take some of these points back to the speakers who had prepared the content which was really great for them to hear and one particular team the dietetic team in Bucks actually that it's really sparked a desire for them um, to sort of do more of this kind of content and information delivery for patients so yeah I just wanted to make a, a really big thank you to um, to the PPG for for all your help with that so thank you very much okay. um, next slide please oh sorry no no go ahead uh, yeah next slide please um so the other the other promotion activity we've been doing in the last sort of couple of months really is that we've been taking the health and wellbeing hub just to make uh clinical staff and um basically the cancer teams and sort of the wider the people working in those teams aware of this resource so that they can start to signpost that out to their uh, the patients that they're working with and we've been asking for um you know dissemination of that through through these teams but also asking for uh you know um to, to sort of understand what some of the well-known unmet need might be from some of these teams um we also presented this at the the primary care network so at the moment primary care we haven't we haven't got huge content for the sort of the um the primary care side of things it's uh we're, a piece of work we're actually looking at at the moment around the cancer care review so we hope to be able to present something that is useful for primary care to be able to signpost to their patients as well um next slide please i think this is the last slide so we've actually produced a leaflet um i don't know if jill's on the call but jill helped produce our digital leaflet which um yeah, basically is will now hopefully go into the patient packs. It's been sent to the lead nurses and uh, the information points within each trust, each of our five sort of TVCA trusts. And we're we're hoping that that begins to, you know, spark off a bit of activity around what we're around what we're doing with the videos. We have got a way of being able to track each of the, the trusts sending that out so hopefully we'll know whether there are trusts that need a bit more help in terms of signposting um, and we're also promoting it via we, there are health and well-being services across the patch so this will form part of their um, useful resources that they're able to to bring to patients um, i think that's the end of my presentation it was a bit of a again a bit of a whistle stop um i think that's okay thanks it. thanks natalie does anyone have any immediate questions for natalie that would like to Ask. Uh, yes, yes, please come in. Sorry, Hi. This, I'm just saying Hi. you are, so please come in. Hi, I'm Alice from uh, Hellport West Berkshire. Um, we have not seen this as a as a, a video kind of thing for us to comment. The other question also, I would say, do you? I, I, are these videos translatable to uh, for ethnic minorities or for people with learning disabilities? Um, so I will, I'm not, I'll, I'll try and make sure you get the resource, Alice. Um, I don't know if you're part of the normal distribution group. It did just go out to the normal members, but we can certainly get this uh, information to you. Um, I think that we are looking at what we can do in terms of which ones we can translate. Um, so it'd be really interesting to have a chat with you, actually, if that's if that's OK. Could I could I drop you an email? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that'd okay. be great. Thank and, you. And, and, and Gainer, I think you want to come back in. Gainer, are you still there? I see you've got a hand up, but no. No, not me. OK. I think Kat so has. Must, must be, sorry, it must be someone else's hand then. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to keep, keep an eye on all of them. Okay, Kath, you want to come in? Yeah, I had I certainly fed back to Natalie my comments, but on my husband, he's I'm his carer, um, so he's the patient, and I asked him to look through them and not to appear negative. He just found that they were too long, and I really want to feed that back because, you know, I've been through the process with him. And when you're the cancer patient on that pathway and you come to the end of it or in your middle of it, you need the shortest, briefest snapshot you can to get the best effect. Right. And I really did feel that they were, some of them were very long. And I asked him again this morning and I said, how long would be long enough? And he said, 
no more than five minutes. And if I don't get what I want in the first five minutes, so I don't wish to appear negative, which I'm sure it is, but I think it needs to be tested wider with patients to ensure that they're actually going to use these videos to the effect that we all appear to be seeing that they will. So that, that's, I just wanted to throw that back into the mix. Uh, Kath, I don't think that's, that's uh, negative at all. Um... But I think we need to be realistic okay. on the brain power that people have when they're going through, if they have chemo, or even if they don't, the actual brain power they have to enable them to take on board this information. Yeah. Okay. And they, you know, we all know they get brain fog. So I think, okay. yeah. Anyway, okay, thank you. Pete, Pete, do you want to come in on this issue or something else? No, I, on this issue, it's it's yes, uh, general. It's generally Wait. accepted. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, carry on. Yeah. yeah, it's it's generally accepted in the uh, sort of uh, promotional motion picture industry uh, that eight minutes is the maximum that people can actually concentrate on any video, apart from motion pictures, obviously, but information videos. So I would I would agree totally that if you are in the midst of uh, your process of treatment, especially with chemo. Five minutes will seem like a lifetime, uh, it, and it, it, but it, I, that makes it really difficult to get all the information across. And the example that I always give is ordinary television commercials. In 30 seconds, you have got to get your message across. Right. Now we're talking about four or five minutes, and you just need to think about that. That's, okay. that's all. Uh, thanks for that, Pete. Uh, Natalie, do you want to come back on that briefly, those two points? Yeah, no, uh, I really appreciate that. And actually, Kath, I think, I think, did you say you'd sent me an email? I saw someone survey had said they'd sent me an email, but I didn't get the email. So I was hoping you were on the call. Would you be able to resend that if I give you my email address? Yeah, I certainly sent through an email and I did the survey. So, and I didn't want to appear negative. I did say the content is really good, which it is, but I feel that um, having, you know, said what I said earlier, I think we need to be aware that, you know, patients who are on this pathway is and even at the end of the pathway when they've got consequences of treatment which a lot of people have like the other um gentleman said about the snapshot and the catching people's attention and making sure that the message that you're spending time and money on to get across is actually going to be of benefit to the people you wish it to be of benefit to so yeah, I'll resend my email to you, Natalie. Thank you. I'll pop my email address in here just so it comes directly to me. OK, okay thank you. Okay. Lovely. Yeah, I think just on the timing, I think we're really we're I'm really keen to start having some of those shorter pieces. Um, I think what the way that we've developed this has um, has come from, you know, longer sessions that that clinicians and, and staff are, are used to delivering and this is exactly the kind of feedback we need to hear and we need the evidence to be able to go back and say right we need you to produce a five minute thing on this and what are the key points and that kind of thing but this is the feedback that's really crucial for us to be able to 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 go back if that makes sense completely take what you're saying about the the time for concentration okay thanks that way can we just move on to the next slide and lisa i think you've got to deal with this one or two Lovely, thank you. So I just wanted to give everybody an update with regards to the clinical advisory group. So in the last meeting uh, in December, I mentioned to you that we had a few sort of gaps and a, a few, a number of you came forward. So I'm delighted that uh, Matt, Matt Carter has been endorsed to sit on our upper GI CAG. So Matt in his own right leads the Uzu charity, which is the Oxford Esophageal and Stomach um, group. Um, if I think Matt, you can correct me here, but I think you're maybe just one of a very handful nationally um, that obviously supports patients with regards to kind of upper GI um, cancer diagnosis. So um, he's a great benefit to obviously the, that particular CAG. Um, and with regards to the other nominations, so we had um, two people come forward for the haematology CAG, which was Kath and Ian and Martin for brain. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to secure a, a meeting yet with our... <coughs> Of reps to obviously our CAG lead, should I say, to make those introductions and to sort of have them endorsed. But as mentioned earlier on, it is something that I'm sort of still chasing and, and hoping that we can kind of feed back to you guys to let you know that, um, you know, we've been successful. 
Um, just recently, I've had somebody come forward who would like to sit on our children's CAG. And again, that's just something that I'm waiting to hear back if that's appropriate. So I will keep you all posted once I've heard. Um, gaps wise still on the CAGs, uh, we don't have any patients on our lung, sarcoma and gynaecology CAGs um, and also our acute oncology. Now, very much with regards to lung and acute oncology, um, they they have always had um, trouble um, securing a patient rep or in particular sort of maybe a, a carer due to the nature of obviously the cancer but our acute oncology lead has very kindly asked if he could come along to our June meeting and to explain to you as a group along with an acute oncology nurse um, what it means to actually represent acute oncology um, as a patient once you've obviously seen or, or been seen acute oncology you tend to go back to your sort of specialized sort of tumor um, teams, your CNSs in relation to the, the tumour that you're, you've been diagnosed with. So um, it would be great if um, those obviously that are available could obviously attend June and then maybe we can kind of network out further to see if there's sort of some representation that we can have in filling those gaps. OK, thanks, Lisa. Anyone, any comments or thoughts for Lisa? Yes, go ahead. That's uh, just trying to see who this is. NW. Is that you, Alice, again? Do you want to come in? Kathy, you've still got a hand in. Do you want to come in? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so acute oncology, could you give us a definition, please? Because I don't quite understand what acute oncology is. Right. That's why that's why we've asked our quality <laughs> lead to come. Yes. <laughs> I don't understand how they switch between being acute and is it acute diagnosis or something actually? So, yeah, so you can't give me any more detail at the moment. Should I come in, Lisa? It's Lyndall here, the lead Hi. nurse. So Acute Oncology Service is the um, acronym there. And so it's when someone becomes acutely unwell when they're on their cancer treatment. So perhaps um, where they have a low white blood cell count and come in with a temperature and then uh, there's an acute team that would actually uh, meet the patient and give them their antibiotics and sort of help them during that cancer admission. They also help with... Um, emergency of presentation, so acute um, emergency diagnosis of cancer, um, and then they would be referred to the appropriate team. But normally it helps with um, cancer emergency situations, the acute oncology service. OK, thanks, Linda. Uh, and obviously, as Lisa said, we'll get some more detail on that hopefully at the next meeting. OK, uh, can we move on to the uh, next item then? Lisa, this is you again. So it's still me. Um, it's really frustrating, but I can't actually see anybody or see any hands or any nods or any thumbs up or anything. So apologies. So um, if if I miss anything, I'm sure William will be able to kind yeah. of give me a steer. Thank you. Keep an eye on all the hands as best I can. <laughs> Lovely. So with regards to the patient involvement activities, so at the last meeting, I explained the two diagrams there about who we have feeding in with regards to our patients onto our intern alliance groups and our external alliance groups. I have to say that since December, I've had so much, um, so many people come forward wanting to support various different projects that we're working on. And I can only but heartfully thank you. Um, we have now over 30 patient reps who have come forward to support the alliance and I'm I'm overwhelmed because when I first sort of started on this journey we literally had seven active patient reps so thank you so much for what you're doing and how you're networking out and you know you're sort of advertising what we're doing as an alliance to kind of improve the the outcomes of our, of our cancer patients within the local residency. So that then being said um, from the, the previous meeting and obviously all of the, the representation that is sort of now coming forward, I thought it would be good to maybe discuss with you guys an, a, an approach for capturing involvement. So at the moment, oh, we have very... 
project groups, we have various different tag on the and, and I think to ensure that the reps aren't just attending meetings and that involvement is meaningful, I think somehow it'd be great if we can capture the details about what involvement it is that you're, you're you know, you're involved in. I know that I link in with you guys on a regular basis anyway, kind of one to one and you're giving me sort of some feedback, um, but it, I just thought it would be useful to kind of formalise a process. I think capturing details will help us know as well how engaging that the project leads are with patients um, and that then, you know, their involvement is meaningful. Um, and I think it would also highlight to everybody on the group, sort of, of the wider network, what it is that you're actually taking forward. Um, I think it would be useful to kind of hear from patients directly, but I'm not saying that we perhaps offer that space in the meeting because I think with all the will in the world we just wouldn't have enough time to go around everybody but maybe we could sort of think of a process I could collate a paper prior to each of the meetings just so that everybody is kind of made aware as to what's happening um, within the alliance sort of activities. Um, to, I guess probably to give a little bit more extra content as well is that each of us as Workstream leads, we each have project work plans and trackers and they detail um, deliverables that obviously always relate back to the TVCA priorities and obviously the long term plan of the NHS with regards to cancer services. This is an example of the urology work plan um, or the urology CAG work plan, should I say. And Andrew Mills, who's our project manager, he liaises with our project, our CAG leads, about what it is that they would like to deliver per quarter. And one of obviously the key elements is that is the patient involvement within that quarter. So I know a couple of you are CAG representatives on here. And I know to date that other than obviously giving maybe an update on a call and maybe to express what your support groups have been doing, if you're associated with support groups, no other details sort of being captured. Um, and I, I just kind of really wanted to kind of discuss that with you today. Um, I was just kind of thinking as a minimum what it is that we could maybe capture. Um, and so I think I've got a template here. So my thoughts around, you know, what activities have happened, who the representative was, if there was any particular deadline or if it's an ongoing activity. And again, leading back into those work plans of those project leads. And I'm not suggesting that, as I say, we go around the table, um, but it would just be good to share maybe on a monthly basis with each other. Uh, what activities we've been involved in and also would highlight where engagement is um, lacking and whether or not we can therefore use that to kind of um, encourage whether or not through the project lead, the CAG lead or any other kind of activities that are taking place um, a little bit more involvement. As Williams obviously mentioned when we've had previous meetings, it is about co-production with our patients and getting them involved right from the start and not just necessarily asking them to um, sort of check a document. I think um, I can't see whether or not Ray and Pete are still on the call, but with the head and neck project that was undertaken at Swindon, they were very much from day one, I think, involved in the development of that and also looking at kind of the the evaluation and how the process was put into place. OK, it looks as if both Ray and Peter are still on the call. Do either of you want to come in? No? I'll, I'm happy to uh, come in. Um, yeah, yeah, please do, yep. <laughs> Go on, Pete. <laughs> we, yes, yeah, Swindon, Swindon, actually, it's funny you should mention Swindon because Swindon is going to go live tomorrow for the first time in two years. Right. Uh, we've, we've, we're going to be moving back into Tesco, uh, the community rooms in Tesco's. We're trying to uh, get live uh, meetings uh, for the uh, RBH uh, people. Uh, we're looking at a, a, a venue in Henley. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear from the CNS at RBH that we can actually use that. We have in the past used the um, I, uh, uh, IKEA. But unfortunately, uh, the room that they've given us, which has been excellent, I mean, we can't fault it. It's a beautiful room that we have because it's one of their display rooms with their best furniture. However, it's in the middle of a very busy area and there is no real air, uh, no real movement of air in there. So 
we think that it's uh, probably not a good idea to go back there in the short term. Uh, we've, we, we are live in Oxford. We're live in South um, Southampton. Uh, we are going to be live in, in, in uh, West London and probably out in uh, Sutton as well. And we are live up in Nottingham. So we're reasonably busy. Okay, that's, 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 that's great. Thanks, Pete. Does anyone else want to come in anything Lisa said, or particularly any comments about the, the template? No? So okay. I, I think it's I think it's important to note that some of our patient um, reps head up obviously their own patient support groups, like Pete was just saying. Um, but I'm I'm keen to kind of capture any activities that are specific to the deliverables of the project that they're working on. So I know that there's various different um, maybe fundraising activities that are going on with a group. But as much as that would be useful to know, um, I think maybe through a paper. Um, sort of distributed separately. It's really about capturing what the activities are and how they're supporting the work of what we're doing as an alliance that I'm keen to kind of discuss how we, you know, how, how we put together really. OK, Kathy, you want to come in? Yeah, I think the template suggestion and ensuring that we are doing, helping to do the work for you is great. What I would say is one of my linkages is straight into primary care, into my um, patient group that's linked to my GP practice. That's fine, but you then need to get the GP practice on your side and be able to put through the information that you want to put through into whatever um, format they want it in, whether it's on the website or whether it's through social media because we have a Facebook page. But equally then, you also need to have the patient signed up to the patient group to be able to look at or want to look at as well as the GP practice website. So I think it's great that we've got the links in, but what we don't want to do is, is come up against a brick wall. And I, unfortunately, I, um, sometimes that happens. And I think if you go in from the opposite way into primary care, and get the information in that way, that would be that would be good as well. So I think it's great that we've got the links into various places, but it's equally, it's, it's hoping that we don't come up against bureaucracy and, and can't get our information through. Um, okay. Also, I'm part of the Oxford Blood Group, which is the group that um, looks after all the blood cancer and research within blood cancer. And I know that there is a link into the PPI lead there uh, Katrina Hamilton, who um, who is extremely good at getting information out. And to be honest, I think that would be a better route um, with my involvement than the patient group route at the moment. Um, equally, I think, and I'll, this will be my last point, is that it's catching the patient at the right part of their pathway. So with some of the videos we've looked at and some of our involvement and in our work, it may be that some of the work comes in right at the beginning. So usually they're linked to secondary care then. And then when they, they're discharged or prior to that, they're in remission and they come back into primary care with secondary care there for a while. I think it's where you're going to place that information and where they go, people are going to find it. I think okay. that's... That's quite critical. What, what, what do people need at various stages of the pathway and when? Thank you. Sorry, Kath, don't need to pick you up. But That's I, all right. <laughs> I've got a couple of other people on the camera. Alex? Yeah, um, Lisa, we we discussed by email um, and you kindly offered to help with it, uh, developing a presentation pack for going out to the groups. I just wondered if we had any movement on that yet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's something separate. Yeah. Um, but yes, I spoke with Lyndall about it. She thinks it's a brilliant idea. So you've got our endorsement. I think it would be great to kind of come along and um, sort of support you in a few of those and then more than happy for you to then go off and um, integrate as you would like to and kind of connect with those groups that we've talked about. And obviously that's specifically for prostate cancer, isn't it? OK. Okay, thank you. Pete, do you want to come back in? Something else on this? Yeah, no, I just I just wanted to quickly ask a question about this uh, template. Okay. Uh, it's very difficult for me to actually, I, I might get Ray in on this. Uh, it's 
the description of planned actions. Well, our planned actions is to look after patients after they've completed their treatment. The older, that's easy. That's uh, either me or Ray. Completion date, there is no completion date. We're, we're doing this okay. every month, every week. Uh, and remedial actions, well, we don't, we don't set milestones. They set the milestones for us. The patients come to us with issues. Uh, and so either I'm misreading this totally, or I, you know, I, ju I just don't quite get it as far as we're concerned. And, and I don't know if Ray agrees with that or not. Yeah, look, Pete, can I come in on this? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on this if I can. Um, my, my, my job before I retired was a project manager, so this sort of thing is right up my street. So I understand <laughs> what it's all about. Um, but it is, this is to do with specific projects rather than, as you were talking about, Pete, the day-to-day -day activities associated with Heads Together. Yeah. So I think this is this is what you're getting at, I think, here. Okay. You know, where there is a specific project and there's some work to be done, this is all about keeping that work under control. OK, I think that that's very helpful. I think you're doing lots of nothing. Yeah, no, I just wanted to come in and say that's exactly um, what we're trying to get at here, what Lisa has presented. This isn't actually about you commenting, <clears throat> excuse me, on your patient support groups and how you're going with your activity there. This is about if you belong to a CAG or a specific work stream that is doing work for the Thames Valley, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we want you to report back or to give us feedback on how that's going. And this is where this template fits in, OK? OK, OK, thank you. Um, I mean, if anyone has any other comments, they might want us to just get back to Lisa directly and obviously we, we can we can modify this. But I think Ray's absolutely right that, you know, to, to remind us that it's, it's project focus and therefore it might not suit everyone. But please do so give Lisa some feedback and uh, maybe we just need to pilot it a bit, uh, you know, and let's, let's see what happens. OK, uh, Lisa, anything else you need to add? No, that's lovely. I'll pull maybe a process together and circulate it all for comment. That would be really appreciated. Thank you. OK, thanks very much then. Uh, next item then. Right, next slide. Yes, I mean, this is this is I mean, I think it's very important that we have a, a two way feedback going on between the, uh, the board uh, and this group. Um, I've only just had my my second meeting, so it's still early days, but I think what I'm already seeing is there, there isn't really a kind of a, a regular feedback from, from us as patients into that executive, and that's something I'd like to try and uh, resolve. So um, what we have at, at the moment is simply just some uh, key things that I've, that I've picked out. Uh, the baselining in terms of endoscopy. Um, I mean, the, the board did receive considered the, the report uh, and, you know, the, they remind us that the network was set up in um, June 2021 in response to NSCSC commissioning. Uh, and there was a recommendation there for the need for kind of significant reform and in, uh, investment in diagnostic services. I think we can see that that's beginning to beginning to come through. So what the executive needed to do was, was as, as it says there, to um, complete a full baselining of, of services and also recognising that again, uh, that there are some real gaps in capacity. So that's just a very quick feedback on that one. Um, the next one, um, operational performance. It's always helpful to kind of get uh, feedback on reports on performance, although inevitably they tend to be kind of rocket through quite quite quickly. So you have to kind of make sure you try and grab on all the all, all the key ones. Um, I think the the there is a recommendation across the alliance that uh, you know demand is going to return to what it was previously, and therefore we're likely to get you know significant increase in, in volumes as a as a result of that. Um, and you know so, for example, planned reductions in vial screening age, people are have not to come forward. So so you know acknowledging those people have have that and this treatment, and again greater referrals from. Um, GP consultations. So again, you can see what the uh, what the action is there that uh, the uh, in the executive have them um, committed to. And then finally, for the purposes of, of this feedback, um, this critical thing about addressing shortfall in in, in first treatment. Um, 
I think you know the key thing there is is that the the action focusing on on sort of how we proactively work with the alliance to improve referrals and to support the awareness activities from well from last month. So that's a very quick whiz through, but let me just pause and see if anyone wants to raise any questions on those. And I may need to put in uh, Linda and uh, Lisa in order to deal with them. So in terms of the endoscopy baselining, anyone got any comments or questions on that? No, OK, the next one, operational performance. Anyone got any comments or questions or is it all self-evident? No, uh, and then shortfall in first treatment, which I you know is something we're all very concerned about, particularly you know the the impact of the pandemic. Anyone, any thoughts, comments, anything they want to share on that? Yes, Vicky. Um, I was just going to say you you mentioned that we're expecting the demand to get back to where it was. Um, have we? I mean, are we at a point where we've seen a surge or do we expect to see a surge or do we expect it to return to pre-pandemic levels? Uh, Linda, can you do with that? I will, yeah. No, I mean, referrals in many places are, are back to where they were or, or more um, already. So we are seeing that, but we expect that to be sort of going on for a period of time. Um, so it's not just a, a quick return. You know, we've had a couple of years of reduced referrals that we're needing to sort of support patients to come forward and to be seen. OK, thank yes, you. And I, and I think I recall from the December board that there was, uh, you know, some reports coming through there that there was significant increase in demand across a number of different centres. It was it was variable. But, you know, I think I think that is clearly coming through and will continue to come through. Lisa, anything you want to add? The only thing I was going to add was that one of our patient reps, I'm not quite sure if she's on the on the line at the moment, but Jan had mentioned about um, going through data and referrals, exactly like what we've just said about, you know, knowing the levels. So I thought it might be interesting for the June meeting to have somebody from our data team come and represent and sort of share with us what data that they have, the latest with regards to referrals. Right. No, I think that's a very good point. Uh, Kath, do you want to come in this one briefly? Yeah, sorry. So the last action to encourage system members, can you just put a bit more meat around that? Because I I don't quite understand where that's going. OK, Lisa, do you want to come in this one? I think on from the executive board, system members are our trusts. Would I be right in saying that, Lyndall? Yeah, I was just going to say that's looking at trust, primary care, screening, everyone sort of working proactively together with the Alliance to try and improve those referrals coming into the system and raising the awareness um, for, for patients to step forward. OK. Does that does that answer your question to some extent, Kath? Yeah, OK, that's great. Has anyone got anything else that they haven't already thought of that they want to raise on any of these points before we move on? No? OK, let's move on to the next item then. OK, so that's me. Um, yes, thank that's you. Me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, around this time of year, we have the national sort of operating guidance or planning guidance that comes through for the system then to, to work with to develop the priorities for the next year. So very kindly, NHS England on Christmas Eve gave us the sort of priorities for 2022-23. Uh, now, the, the guidance can be clicked on there, so you can actually see it um, in full <coughs> if you'd like to, to read it when all of this comes out. But it's really important, um, this guidance, because it helps us with shaping our priorities um, as an alliance of, of what we see as important um, to help restore health services um, or cancer care um, a, a across the system. So some of the things, for example, that may uh, that are in the guidance um, are things around um, faster diagnosis. So we heard a little bit about that from Gaynor and the, the changes that are happening to that guidance and then the priorities that we as an alliance will take with that. There's quite a, a considerable section around diagnostics, which we know are under significant pressure trying to support the number of referrals coming through um, and the workforce requirements. 
Um, and then there's uh, further work around uh, taking forward things like the targeted lung health check and other innovations sort of with the, car um, the colon capsule endoscopy. So there, there's considerable work within um, cancer to take forward. Now, as a, an alliance, we are as teams looking at that um, within our work streams and trying to determine the appropriate um, way forward that will be taken to board um, or a stakeholder event later in April. Um, and what we can do is at the June meeting, bring those priorities back to you and, and share what um, they will be. They'll, they'll probably follow a similar theme to what they were this last year, which just to recap for your um, benefit, um, it's, you know, there's one around the sustained um, operational performance. We had one around delivering the RDS pathway, another around innovation and early diagnosis. And then the fourth was around personalised care and delivering that. So within those, it goes a little bit further each year with trying to deliver it. So with the RDS work, we had been prioritising lung and colorectal. Well, within the guidance, it sort of pushes to talking about optimal time pathways and how we can support doing that for four different tumour sites, plus pushing another two that are or three that are going to be coming through. Within the personalised care agenda, again, there's uh, been a lot of work around breast, colorectal, urology, stratified or, or patient um, initiated follow up. Um, that's going to be extended to haematology and gynaecology um, as well. So there's going to be considerable amount of work across the system to try and support the delivery of this um, cancer transformation work. But if we go into um, something that underpins all of the pieces of work are these four um, principles for delivery. So one is around looking at the um, health inequalities in the system and how can we support um, making sure that we are reaching all those hard to reach groups. And I think that's something perhaps as a PPG we need to consider of who's in our membership and how perhaps could we get to those hard to reach groups and make sure that our messages are getting um, out there and being supported. So there is some work with the Cancer Allies. It's a group that's been developed um, within the Alliance um, with the GP lead trying to reach um, specific groups. But perhaps that's something that we could talk a little bit more about um, at a future meeting. Um, there's always, you know, we want to hear the, the patient public voice um, with all the work that we're doing. And as we've said before, truly really co-designing any of our service transformation work. So with any of these priorities coming through and any uh, that the Alliance takes forward as the sort of key priorities, we'll want to make sure that there's a patient involved in any of those work streams. Um, Cancer workforce is a significant issue. You will have read in the national press the real pressures on cancer workforce. Um, we're trying to look at not um, replacement staff, but other staff that may be able to help in certain areas of a cancer pathway or two-week wait pathway and delivering services to try and relieve pressure on other harder um, uh, sort of workforces that um, are, are struggling with their recruitment and, and training requirements. We need to do some quite dramatic sort of transformation work to support our workforce um, going forward to make sure we have the right people to deliver with the right skills and competency um, going forward. And then a lot of that, um, we need to be looking at innovation um, and how that can support our workforce with delivering their work. And then finally, uh, as we spoke about, data really drives a lot of what we do and we need to make sure that we've got the right data coming through informing us um, uh, of what the pressures are in the system uh, and where we need to focus um, some of our attention. So, so that's a, a very brief sort of summary of what the, the operational guidance is. It's very much the team are working on that currently. We don't have our final sort of plan um, that we're delivering as an alliance, but by our next meeting, we will be able to share with you what that is. Can okay. I take any questions? Yeah, any questions for anyone, Lindell? Lindell? Any comments? Uh, yes, okay. 
Uh, hi, yeah, one thought. I, I'm a prostate cancer patient and I, I had some sight of the national figures from um, NHS England that, that PCUK have been using. And one thing it does show, which could have a, a significant impact on finances, are that there, there's a massive um, decline in the number of people who are coming forward at the early stages of cancer. Right and a very significant increase now starting to appear of people coming forward late stages which is basically when you know that they've now got some serious symptoms and end up in um a and e or, or whatever but this has big implication on cost because certainly for things like prostate cancer i i sort of learned quite recently it costs about 20 times more to treat somebody who's stage four than it does to treat somebody who's an early stage so if a lot of these early stages are not coming forward early anymore and turning to late stages, the, the cost implication for that sounds horrendous, never mind the, the personal implications for the patients. OK, thanks. Uh, Linda, do you want to come back on that? Just to say, no, you're absolutely right on that. And, you know, the um, National Cancer Plan and the Long Term Cancer Plan and, and Operational Guidance talk about trying to have 75 percent of stage one, two cancer diagnosed in the next sort of five years. You know, we've got a long way to go to sort of get those figures up. But a lot of it is about public awareness coming forward, feeling confident to go to their GP um, or attend their screening program to, to help with diagnosis at an earlier stage. OK, thank Kath. you. Kath, you want to come back in? Yeah, it's just a comment on three. Um, is that doctors or nurses or across the board? All of it. So, we, you know, we've got real pressures with medical staffing, nursing staff and um, diagnostic staff, radiographers, etc. So, um, you know, there's significant um, workforce issues that we're trying to, to work through around training um, and, and staff feeling supported um, going forward. OK, so just one minor comment on that. My daughter is currently working in oncology. She's a junior doctor. And every day, day in, day out, she is giving or with somebody else giving bad news. She's not seeing anybody getting better. Right. I think that is very poor that you don't see anybody get better. You spend four months doing the role in this particular hospital. So it may be something within the, the training of um, junior doctors coming through the discipline that perhaps needs to be looked at. And just... Um, minorly on number four, is the data-driven approach primarily for cancer treatment outcomes or for cancer outcomes post-treatment? Because that's quite different because you may, if you're looking at data post-treatment, you need to be looking at support for those patients in lots of different ways. So that's really just a comment to take away. Okay. I don't want an answer on it. It's just a comment. OK, thanks. Thanks, Kath. Um, I think the whole kind of thing about the workforce is really challenging because we just know how, how difficult it is to recruit new people in, particularly with some of the kind of the, the programmes that the Alliance is kind of trying to follow through. It's it, it's really challenging. And uh, I think, you know, it's a question about can we find creative ways to try and deal with those challenges? I know there's a lot of minds being um, applied to that. So, you know, we should just have to cross our fingers and wait and see. Linda, anything you want to say finally to wind up on this? No, I think I've covered everything. I'm happy to take any questions from anyone if they come okay. along. Anyone else got any, any any further questions before we move on? Kathy, that's still a historical hand you've got up, yeah? OK, uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll move on to the next item. So, um, item five, Claire. Hello. Um, I've just popped in today just to um, off the back of that, actually, really, I suppose, is to say that um, there are a few things coming along that it would be really helpful for you to um, be involved in if you so desire. We've got a workforce steering board that we're going to be setting up with effect, hopefully from April, moving through into the new sort of financial working year so to speak and the workforce steering board is going to be made up of people who are doing the job on the ground people like yourselves who have experienced the services or 
have family members who have done so and the senior managers um, around the different trusts and hospitals and the, the lead nurses. And that's because we need to be able to drive a lot of the work that has to happen. And um, me as a singular person with Lindell, we don't have the capacity to do that. It's not about asking you to do any actual work. It's about gaining that consensus of opinion as to the direction of travel we meet. We need to go in with a particular item or project um, and being able to have open discussions about the things so that we can gain consensus across um, the geography for adopting potentially new ways of working so that we can address our workforce issues that we have. So having the experience of people like yourselves in that is vitally important because there's no point in changing the way we do things if it doesn't work for the people that it's meant to be working for. And that's people who are receiving treatment and support and the people that are doing that as part of their role. The next thing is um, primary care education. Um, we've got a big hole in the training that's available for staff working in primary care and we're going to be employing a project manager who is going to solely focus on that for a year. Um, and as far as that is concerned, it would be really helpful to me if there are if you any of you would consider having a conversation with the person once they're in post um, or if they could come to this meeting to get some ideas from you on your side of the fence what what it was like for you dealing with primary care and the support that you received from them or the information you received from them going through um, your treatment and your aftercare or your pre-diagnosis so that again that gives us an idea from your perspective, what training we might need to consider putting in place for that workforce. The last thing is next week, no, not next week, week after, um, we're going to have a day which is the 15th of March and it started in Manchester and it's sort of picked up momentum. So now it's the National Cancer CMS Day, Clinical Nurse Specialist Day. And we're going to be doing some tweets and media coverage, stuff on the website, um, blogs, all sorts of bits and bobs going on across the patch. And kindly, two of you have offered to participate in that and do some stuff around your own personal story. And I would just ask that actually um, we've got a tweet, a hashtag tweet, and that if any of you do tweet, um, Lisa can share the hashtag with you and if you want to stick anything out there around it or you want any of our um, banners on your email or posters or anything that you want to share around just so that we can acknowledge the work that the uh, clinical nurse specialists in cancer do for us I'd be much appreciative of your participation and really that's all from me at the moment okay Thanks, Claire. Anyone got any any questions? Uh, Andrew, you got a hand up? Uh, yeah, I'm just so the clinical nurse day. Is that with a review to a view to trying to recruit some more CNSs or or everything patients talking CNSs or what's the idea behind that? Bit of a one stop shop actually. Um, it's about what they were feeling across the country. Um, CNSs had sort of fed back that they felt. A little undervalued and under recognized um, over the last few years and so yes it's about showing recognition for them and showing appreciation and understanding of the work that they do and their clinical expertise but it's also being able to use that as um, a recruitment pull on other nurses to bring them into that profession as well um, so that that's it's the sort of a two-pronged attack I guess OK, I mean, as a patient, I would love to say how valuable they were to me because th they were and I'd love them to know that. But of course, at the at the end of my treatment, I don't have any cause to see them anymore. So it doesn't no. happen. No. So if there's an opportunity to do that, that would be great. That would be really helpful. Lisa, can I for you, Claire? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Voluntold, you are volunteered one or okay. the other, isn't it? Thank you for that, uh, um, Andrew. Lisa will um, 
make contact and put you in contact with me and I can um, sort that out for you if you want to say a thank you, just if it's a sentence and then we can share that out from you as well. That would be lovely. And I take on board what you said around the, the fact that once you finish that treatment or that 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 support, you don't see them anymore. So you don't get that opportunity to go back and and say that thank you to them potentially. So maybe that's something we need to think about as well within the hospitals. How how can we affect that so that people like yourself get that opportunity to say thank you and they can then get that feedback on it as well. Thank okay. you. Okay, Matt, do you want to come in? You... Yeah, just hello. Yeah, just a very quick word for Claire. And that's um I mean our patient support group based around Oxford, we um have we've been in contact with a Dr. Chris Jones who's leading a national project on primary care not education as such but um, patient care best practice and um, I mean it's really he's focusing on esophageal and cancer and panc uh, pancreatic cancer and stomach cancer patients um, but he's had over 500 respondents from, a, from an awful lot of pa uh, patients and former patients, or current patients and former patients. So there might be some useful nuggets in there for you. Although Certainly. it's quite specific for those cancers, I think, you know, the general experience of patients is not dissimilar across the board, wherever they are. So um, if you want to, do you want me to drop me a line about that? That'd be great. Yes, please. If you can get in contact with me, sort of via Lisa or what have you, um, and then we can sort of do some follow up through that channel. Because, yes, if somebody's already done a load of stuff, pointless going back there again, we might as well use it and then be able to yeah. incorporate it across the whole of the patch. So, that'd be yeah, really that's fine. I'm having a chat with Chris on uh, next week, so I'll, I'll, I'll get you in touch with uh, via Lisa. OK, thank you. And I've just seen something come up in the chat about Health Watch as well and the resources is that resources for the, the uh, cns day that you were asking about for health watch or around the primary care education i'm sorry i can't oh let me pop the chat let me see emma emma Thanks. yeah we i can take anything i can ask with regards to the cns day i can speak to our comms officer and ask her if, if there's any chance we can promote it through social media for you yeah. um the workforce steering group potentially was sort of what we might be able to promote as well i work with patient participation groups across oxfordshire so um send it across and then i can have a chat with our exec director and see if it's something we can do for you Thank you. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and Vicky also would like some resources as well. What I will do, um, we're just um, zhuzhing it up with a bit of TVCA sort of graphics and logo stuff. And then as soon as that's done, which I think should be by the end of this afternoon, um, the comms lead is on that at the moment as we speak, I will push it all through to Lisa and Lisa can share it out to you so that you've got all the stuff on the day and you can share through your own networks that way then. And that would be really brilliant, actually. The better we can do this and the more of an impact we'll have. And I, I understand um, there is going to be... Um, a Twitter chat, I believe it's called. Now, I'm not the greatest tweety person in the world, but, you know, we have to do these things sometimes for work, don't we? But okay. I think there's going to be a Twitter chat in the afternoon around four o'clock-ish. Um, and that is being run by UCONS, which is United Kingdom Oncology Nursing something or other. I can't remember the S. Okay. Uh, Society. Society. Thank you, Lyndall. <laughs> and one of our lead nurses is the um, president of it at the moment, I believe. Might have got that wrong. He might be the chair. I think he's president, though. Um, yes. And so that's all happening on Twitter around four o'clock ish as well on the 15th. So if any of you want to get involved in that and at that point, tweet whatever it is, you know, was great about your experience. Preferably not tweet bad experiences, just send them to me so we can use them to improve things moving forward. So that would be really okay. helpful. Okay. You'll have all that stuff come out to you through Lisa. Okay, thanks, Claire. It's great to see so many of us getting excited about this CCNS day. I think they're, uh, as a number of people said, they're, they're greatly um, overrated. And I think it's really important that we find a way of uh, celebrating that. And, and dare I say, even reminding their, some of their colleagues of the of the value that they have. 
Okay. Yes, well, hopefully you're right and it will have that inward facing promotional effect as well. OK, Fingers crossed, William. OK, thanks, Claire. Thank and you. If there's anything else from this before we move on to the next item? No? OK. Bye, next everyone. Item. OK, bye, Claire. OK, uh, next slide, please. I mean, th this is really tied into, I suppose, some of the key things we were talking about at, uh, at the last meeting, my, my first meeting. Uh, and it's about trying to, I suppose, get some systems in place um, so that so that we so you not only have the items, you know, the opportunity to submit items for the agenda, but that therefore hopefully some of the most relevant of those can, you know, uh, contribute to what I was talking to earlier in terms of real feedback and contribution to what's happening on the executive. So obviously um, it's important that they are focused on the on the program principles and you know the, the, the priorities that we're working on and we, we've spent quite a lot, a lot of time talking about those and we'll come back to to more of them as, as, as we go through further meetings um next slide please so this is really just something which i think um we would like to sort of test out just to see if we if we can make it work um for the alliance for for the executive and, and other kind of meetings this is the kind of approach that they have. So there's a there's a call for items which would come out from Lisa sort of three weeks before our, our scheduled meetings. Um, and then if people are, are, are submitting, you know, some some thoughts, it's always helpful then to have the opportunity to discuss any requirements with Lisa uh, once you've done that. So we, we, we can begin to kind of, you know, look at how is that best presented? Um, what slides do you need? Do you need to do a paper or, or whatever? Um, and then bullet point three, that you know anything for that we want included in the slide pack, pack should we try and make them available for for about a uh, a week and a half again before the meeting, again to try and ensure that you all have a good chance of reading reading papers and getting into into the depth of what we're planning to talk about uh, a week in advance of the meetings. That that that's what we want to um, try out. Um, Lisa, do you want to add anything to that or, or open it up? No, so I think previously we kind of shared in December's meeting the dates of when calling for items was um, the deadline kind of for any submission of agenda items. I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be formal. Anyone can just send me an email with regards to, I know that a couple of you have, yeah. um, and our next agenda item is, you know, following on from that. Yeah. Um, but the the next meeting that we have, the next PPG meeting is dated the 8th of June. So a call for papers will go out on the 16th of May um, and a deadline for that will be the 30th. Um, but by all means, we're, we're always looking at setting future agenda items, always linking back to our priorities. So going forward, it may well be after we've kind of shared with you the priorities in June that we're all currently working on at the moment. That will then help as well feed for new um, agenda items going forward. OK, thank you. Um, are people happy with to, to kind of try this out? Does this seem like a reasonable? Uh, if, if you're happy, please nod. <laughs> OK, some nodding. OK, thumbs up. Yeah, that, that works too. OK, uh, let's move on then to the next item. Um, and as Lisa just been saying, I think this is, in a sense, the first example of, of that. Uh, so, Ian, over to you. Hello there. Hopefully I'm, I'm online and people can hear me. Um, my experiences are taboo. It's, it's finding out why the taboo is with um, people like Macmillan and Hummingbird and Maggie's as to why they're not being used. Um, as soon as I was personally diagnosed with cancer, it was one of the first places that I visited was Maggie's um, because I was diagnosed at the Churchill in Oxford. And it surprises me how little um, input um, of patients going through the doors of Maggie's is. Um, there must be probably 20 or 30 people a day are diagnosed and given the news that they've actually got cancer. Maybe more than that at, at the Churchill. Yet you don't really see that many people using Maggie's or 
I mean, Macmillan's, when you see your specialist nurse and they take you into a little room, side room and explain what's going to be happening to you and give you your separate folder with um, your contact points, mainly filled with information from Macmillan. And they'll also say about Maggie's. But you don't really see that real connection between the two. I wonder if it's if you think it's a good idea that maybe the specialist nurses would take you to the support centre that's nearest to you and start discussing it and introducing you to the staff there rather than just giving you a piece of paper and going, oh, if you need some support, why don't you try Maggie's or Macmillan are really useful here are all their different booklets or look at page 17 if you want to follow up. I don't know if there's a, another way of um, helping to increase the awareness of these support services. You know, they're really useful, but is there a taboo that people don't want to actually, they feel ashamed or they're feeling nervous about actually crossing that line and going, actually, I need some extra support because it's, it's not just yourselves going through it. I know that maybe I was selfish myself that I concentrated on my own illness. But what about your partners and your friends and your families? The extra support for them, they all need it. They don't necessarily know what to say. You know, people phone up and go, oh, didn't really know what to say to you. How are you feeling? Is, is there a way that we can start breaking that taboo down? Okay. That, that, that's it. I know that there's other support services like Hummingbird, and cancer care and whatever, South Berks Hospice. There's loads of other places out there, but do we just wait until it's nearly the end before you actually ask for actually some support? Whereas actually, we all need it. We just need to be brave enough to go, actually, can I just step forward? Yeah. I don't know if that, that's a, a, a useful contribution to you, but it's. Um, I think we need to help and support these other services. Okay. Anything you, else you want to add in before I open it up for, for comment? Because a number of people are keen to come in. I, I can I can see there's loads of people, so let's bounce it around and see what other people feel. Okay, so if you could be brief as you can, please. Ray, you want to go in first? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And to me, I think the way to approach this is We've got to somehow get some sort of formalisation of the, you know, how the support groups fit into a patient's pathway, whether it's, you know, during or after treatment. I think that there has to be, um, you know, at the moment it's kind of hit and miss as to whether uh, a particular support group will be mentioned. You know, I mean, we know um, with head and neck cancer, uh, the church have been very, very good, you know, at, um, giving our name out to patients but it's you know once when they get busy you know that doesn't necessarily happen so i think we somehow just need to get some sort of formalization that's really all i wanted to say okay thanks then uh janet just before we bring you in, i just want to flag up the people but janet was the other person who identified a, a particular topic for discussion around referral data and what we think is probably the best thing to do about that is again to perhaps have the data lead at the, gym, at the June meeting so we can sort of really understand what are they collecting and what they're not. So, Janet, do you want to come in on this, please? Janet, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. sorry about that. Oh, my, my, my computer's got a mind of its own. And um, I was feeling, yes. Can I, can I just say um, I totally agree with what Ian says. And actually, Ray as well. And and I, th there really needs to be some some way of channeling information about support to the to the patients directly. I th I think you know the idea of having a file with all sorts of bits of paper in. From my own experience running a breast cancer support, a lot of people don't read those, but there are a lot of people who actually once they come to a support group or they come to the Maggie's you know, they can't praise the support enough and say, if only I'd found you sooner. So that channel of getting to the patient is absolutely essential for the patient, quite honestly. 
really, really important point. And thank you both for what you said previously. Okay, thanks, thanks, Janet. Uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, this this comes up a lot in the in amongst all the prostate cancer support groups. Uh, one scenario where I've seen this work well is where the support is part of the patient treatment pathway. So, mm. for example, the Macmillan Centre is doing the holistic needs analysis, um, uh, it's, which was done in another hospital I'm involved with. Um, I, as um, Lisa and one or two people may know, I, I run sessions for patients on hormone therapy and they get referred to me by a, clinic, by a consultant. Look, go, yeah. go on that. This is run every couple of months. And this is how the patients get in to see a support group. Unless it's actually part of their, their treatment pathway, they've got too many other things on their mind to, to, to deal with other things at the moment when they get diagnosed and told they've got cancer. I think that's, I think that's important. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Kath? Yeah, I think I'd just echo what everybody else has said, but also um, Maggie supported me from day one. My husband really didn't go there, so he was a cancer patient. Um, he looked to a charity that was specific to his cancer, which is Lymphoma Action. Yeah. I found the Millen support is good for information. Um, the holistic needs didn't work for us at all. But likewise with somebody else, a load of information was just left for my husband um, and nobody actually spoke to him. It was just left on his bedside in the hospital. So I think it needs to be woven into the support, but it's not right for everybody. And it's not right for everybody initially, because I wanted to stand in day treatment unit with a Maggie's T-shirt on one day. But they there wasn't a way through to do that. And I think that, you know, hundreds of people go into the chemotherapy day treatment unit at the Churchill every week. So it has to be part of the process and the pathway. I know it's not the hospital and I know the hospital can't necessarily provide all of the support that patients need. But please direct them to places that they can find this great support that's actually out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kath. Thank I got some very important points there. Claire? Hi, everyone. So I'm Claire Marriott. I'm the centre head at Mikey's Oxford. And uh, part of me is sad to hear that people feel that they're not directed when they could be. But i um, glad to hear, of course, that people are pleased with the support we offer and I, I think sometimes Ian I'm sorry I missed the start of your points that is the very two minutes of the whole session that I stepped out of the door so I missed the beginning of what you said but I think perhaps you might have been in the centre at quiet times but believe me that um, some days people are here all day long and it is full to the gills and we do reach about 40 percent at least of new cancer patients over the years. So we do see a lot of people, but just not maybe all together at the times that you've been here. And we do have a constant stream of the teams, the clinical teams coming over asking for our leaflets because they give them to their patients. And I know what I've, I know that's not ideal for everyone because there's too much information. Um, and we are just be reassured that we are working on a way to get, we know that if people are introduced to us earlier on, that's better. So something around, we've been trying to get a session called getting started with cancer treatment so that people who are preparing for radiotherapy or chemotherapy might come and have some of that work with us here in Maggie's. And it's right at the beginning, it's an ordinary part of what happens. And there you are, you can see who we are, what we are and what we offer. And I agree um, with what you said about, it's not for everyone, that's the thing. Not, not everyone does need or want support, actually, but we just need to make sure we're accessible for those who do. Okay, thanks, Claire. Uh, Vicky? I would just like to say, yes, I agree with everything that's been said, but I would say that um, I think it's also about perception in some cases about support groups and what they offer some people might think oh it's a support group it'll be they'll be talking about awful things all of the time yeah, yeah, yeah. so i do think there's some education around that um i do also think a geography comes into it so i'm mm -hmm. based over reading way so i don't really have access to maggie's or the hummingbird unless i drive quite some time so i think that's also a, a factor to add into this so location is important um, 
so with the cancer support network which we um which i run uh, <coughs> sort of throughout the region that i'm in um i would say that people come to us mainly to connect with each other and and take part in our events and that's sort of how we encourage people to get involved um so i think it's a sort of a it's a bit of an educational piece around what people's perceptions are to yeah. do with um, support groups and that they're not all sort of sitting around a table talking about cancer, which is probably the last thing you want to do. Yeah. Um, and it's also about geography. So I think that does need to be sort of taken on board, but that's sort of it really. OK, thanks. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, Linda? Thank you. I was just going to say, I think timing might be quite critical because at the point of diagnosis, I think quite often you close down and you just want to think it through, toss it about in your own head, talk to your family. Um, and it's later that you might be open to the idea of joining something. And so we need to have a way of reminding or prodding people at a more point when they're ready to be receptive mm -hmm. and I think there are a lot of support agencies out there national ones phone ones all sorts of things and people perhaps work their way through a few before they find what really works best yeah. for them mm -hmm. so okay. don't despair yeah, yeah no thanks again a very, very important point Linda uh Pete you want to come in yeah, just uh, I'm almost echoing what everybody else has said, but I think the one thing that you that we need to remember is that when the patient is uh, first diagnosed with cancer, a he had no, he's got probably got no experience of that, and he also probably he or she also probably has no experience of anything called a support group. They probably never needed one. Uh, mm -hmm. You get given uh, lots of bits of paper. I know in my case, they all came home and went into a filing cabinet and weren't looked at again ever. Mm. Uh, if I wanted something, I just called up the CNS and said, help. Uh, and and then then my my memory was was um, revised. But that it, it's really important, I think, to just somehow make people aware that it's there if they think they need it. Uh, yeah. But it, just to give somebody a leaflet and hope that they will remember. I, some do but not all of them and some of the ones uh, we know from our own experience that they really would have loved to have found something earlier. Okay, thanks Pete. Uh, and Ian Bellock? Are you there Ian? Yes, just uh, just unmuting. Um, okay. The, I mean, I think there's, there's one key point, which is that, um, and I, I run the um, Oxford Myeloma Support Group, is that everybody that comes to our group has one thing in common, which is that it's their positive, proactive action in attending a meeting. Um, and I think that what I find is, is certainly when I was first diagnosed, I didn't have any, I mean, the thought of a support group didn't cross my mind. Yes. Um, and, then, and then much later on in my treatment, coming back to timing points, I wondered, you know, how I had, um, you know, I, I wondered how on earth it was possible not to have a support group um, at a specialist cancer hospital, uh, mm. which, which was why I set it up. Mm. Um, and I think there are probably two things that, that that really sort of resonate with me. First of all, is that is that people have to proactively want to join the group or attend the group. Um, and secondly, it comes back to this point about making people aware that the group exists. And I think from that point of view, what we found practically is involving the medical staff in our meetings means that whenever they're talking to patients on the ward, you know, quite often they'll just mention it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no formalisation of it. It's, it's word of mouth. And and certainly Claire and her team at Maggie's are, are brilliant at referring people our way. You know, okay. just, just just the medical side um, and the professionals being uh, aware aware of his existence as much as anything else. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, sorry, and the final point, as I say, is is you know, um, Carolyn in phlebotomy is brilliant because I mean she always sticks a notice up on her wall, advertising the group, and of course everybody with myeloma goes in for regular blood tests. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Claire. Is that still a legacy hand, or do you want to come back in? 
Yeah, I take it as a legacy hand then. Okay, um, let's just finally wrap, wrap this up. I mean, I think for me, there's there's some really important points I've been made here, and I think this is uh, demonstrates exactly why it's important to have uh, these kind of items which are brought forward by you. I think it's also it seems to me something that it's worth giving some thought to uh, in terms of how uh, these strong feelings on, on these very important points are fed, are fed back to the executive. I certainly think this is an example of one that I would uh, I would like to you know make sure that that happens because clearly we don't have a, a kind of systematic you know information informing uh, options you know it it's you know what people are re reporting is it's can quite often be be very random and I don't think we can rely on randomness to deal with all the kind of challenges that we have to deal with. Um, Linda, anything you want to say on this before we wrap wrap it up? Um, I think it's a really complex sort of topic and I don't think that there's a simple solution and I think um, a lot of the things that I would have mentioned have been touched upon but um, you know everyone takes on board their cancer diagnosis at different stages and information needs are, are different you know uh, across the board by tumor site and by individual and then within families and so there's not a one-way fits all type of situation and that's where HNA actually is quite helpful if there's specific questions um you know the, the healthcare professional can guide people to the right information to help support them at that time and raising it and you know i'm not you know a lot of healthcare professionals will probably be sharing this information but as you say there's packs and it goes into packs and at that time a person may not necessarily be looking at it you know, with any sort of cancer information that we give, often it's multiple times before, uh, you know, it's necessarily fully understood. So I just think, uh, you know, we need to be um, sort of careful with our approach. It's not a one size um, fits all um, with what we're doing here. And I just, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots more that I could comment on, but I think for the sake of time, you know, um, I'll probably just stop um, there. But, you know, support groups aren't for everybody. Um, yeah. And so I think that just needs to be remembered. And um, also, Ian, I'm just, I'm not sure, do you have any data to show that you think that people aren't going to any of these support things? Because I think what you may find is that they attend at different time points when they feel ready to, to do that. Um, it may not be day one, though, of a diagnosis often people on that day one just want to get out of the hospital as fast as possible yeah, uh, and go elsewhere. I mean, I, th I think Linda's right to remember to remind us that it's a, it's a complex area and there kind of people make lots of different choices. For me, the, the key thing is the information available consistently so that people can make whatever the relevant choice is for them. You know, I think that's, that's a critical point. OK, um, uh, I think we can then wrap this one up. But as I say, I think this is a, a good example of how this kind of thing can work. And uh, I also were very keen to find a way of making sure this is fed back to the executive. OK, any other business? Uh, I do have one uh, promotional item to deal with first. Can we show the next slide? There we go. <laughs> yeah, bit of, bit of pr promotion here. Again, I think that this is an example of uh, one of the things you might want to do uh, on the agenda is you know not necessarily have to talk about these things but if people want to send information to to lisa we could you know, again just put together a brief paper and it could be there, just there for people to note so that might be something that you might want to um uh, have a go at um anyone might want to make any comments on that or any thoughts on that as a, as a future way to approach things no okay well, I don't have any other any other business on this. Anyone else wants to raise anything? Anyone want anything they want to raise? Okay. Uh, sorry, could I could I just mention about the ball? Yes, please do. Yep. Sorry, I just had the postman just turned up. Um, bad timing. Bad timing. Bad timing. <laughs> uh, the, the only good thing was it's actually a, an auction prize that's just been sent through to me. Um, mm -hmm. We really do need to sell a few more tickets. I'm quite despondent about um, how little support we've had from the NHS staff, shall we say. Um, we've given them a discount. I've got one person for, that's asked for an NHS discount. Um, 
we do need to sell a few more tables. We've had a few people having to drop out for personal reasons. Um, the deadline really for, for paying for tickets is this Friday. So yeah, if anybody can get, get a few more people together, that would be great. We are trying to raise money for Maggie Centre Oxford and Myeloma UK. Okay. Okay, thanks, Lillian. Anyone who feels that they could promote it, I'm sure Ian would be very, very grateful. But uh, you are coming up to the deadline, you know, fairly fast. So clearly we need to have some kind of um, quick actions around this if we could. So that'd be, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, OK, so thanks, Ian, for sort of, uh, you know, flagging this up as a as an opportunity that we might want to do in the future for other things. So let's let's uh, see if people want to do that. And if so, send the information to uh, to Lisa. OK, Lisa, before we wind up completely, anything you want to add as a, as a final comment? Nothing from me. Just a big thank you to everybody for attending today as usual. Thank you so much for your support. It really is. Um, it really means a lot to us. Yes, and um, thank you uh, for me to make my, my uh, second meeting quite uh, productive and uh, easy to manage. So, uh, and even the technology seems to be working. So let's just kind of uh, drive on and see if we can, you know, continue to make these meetings more yeah. interactive. And we can we can try to make sure that we're getting the key messages back to uh, the executive and any other relevant bits of the alliance. So thank you to everyone who's made presentations. Thank you for all the, for all the comments and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Thanks, William. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.